first it's all about the music Tonight's guests all got into music at school, but ended up performing in very different fields. The first, Dizzy Rascal, became a platinum-selling recording artist with a bag full of awards and number one hits. You might just recognise one of them being played by our second guest, Nicholas McCarthy. Now, he overcame the challenge of being born with one hand to become a top classical concert pianist. Whoa. performer is Jay McGuinness. Now, Jay went on to uh, sell out stadiums with The Wanted and yep. won Strictly along the way. He wants to celebrate the one thing they all have in common. Music was always a big part of my life growing up, and I've been lucky enough to make a career out of it. So I was disappointed to find out that some schools are cutting back on teaching music, meaning it's no longer a big part of kids' education. But today, I'm joining pupils in Bradford, who are putting music at the heart of their education. Say, everyone ready for some school-run karaoke? Yeah! Yay! Let's go. I'm glad you came. I'm glad you came. And it's all down to this man, wannabe pop star turned music teacher, Jimmy Rotherham. Four years ago, Jimmy joined struggling Feversham Primary Academy and turned it into Bradford's very own School of Rock. Are you Bradford's Jack Black? I'm a little bit slimmer, but yeah, I mean, getting that enthusiasm from the children for, for making music. Have you brought your wolf voice? Oh! In 2010, Feversham Primary was placed in special measures by Ofsted. But a new head brought big changes. Music in the school went from just 30 minutes up to six hours a week, and Jimmy introduced a radical new approach to music lessons. I teach something called the Kadai approach. Uh, it's from Hungary. It's, it's all based around games and having fun. When we were at school, we'd probably have a, a song to learn, and we'd sing it 16 times to get it perfect, and you know, like by the fifth go, yeah. Oh. Sing that again. He puts different games into it and it's a lot of fun. I have a guitar at home and um, every lunchtime I go to guitar lessons and I learn more and more each day. We all gather together and we start singing <coughs> really nice and it's fun. How has the school changed since you've introduced the Kadai programme? I've noticed an improvement in behaviour and attitude of the, of the children. Jimmy spends his weekends performing in a covers band, so he knows just how to get the kids pitch perfect for their next gig. You guys are putting on a concert this afternoon. We're going to do about 15 songs in about two minutes. Any of the wanted songs? Funny you should say that. Have you seen that girl? Have you seen her? She's the freakiest girl, you gotta meet her. We've made it, guys. <laughs> I know you're watching, boys. We're here in Bradford. Outside the school gates, Bradford Moor is one of the most deprived and densely populated parts of the city. In our school, you'll find children from every background, children with very little English who, who just come to the country, refugee children, they all get involved at a high level of music. So when Jimmy first came to you with the Kadai programme, what was your first reaction? My staff will not be able to cope with this. You know, so music was non-existent in school. Now we are in the top 10% of all schools in the country for pupil progress. Ahead of the concert, the kids are hard at work rehearsing, Hello, including nine-year-old Abby, one of Jimmy's okay, star ready? students. Oh, there it is. Straight in the living room. Come on, let's hear it. She is the first Muslim girl to be accepted into Bradford's Foundation for Musically Gifted Children. Why would you pick drums? It's really fun uh, to like play. How do you think that's helped you in other classes? Concentrating more on my learning and it's just uh, made me improve. Do you enjoy performing in front of the other kids at school too? At first I feel nervous but then when I get into the room to perform I just get on with it. There's not many parents who'd put up with a drum kit in the living room but Abia's dad and sister couldn't be happier. Are you super proud because she's a trailblazer? Yeah, I'm really proud of her because she's like in such a small age 
Do you ever wish you'd picked a quieter instrument? And nothing in music is a quiet instrument. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the school and it's time for the big performance. 15 songs in just two minutes in front of parents, teachers and the whole school. No pressure. And as soon as music plays, something happens, stays inside you. And we feel that that should be integral. Anyone who walks into this school comments on just, just what a great atmosphere it is. The music's a huge part of that. But it gets everybody together and then we'd all show a different passion about the music. Um, I think that was an absolute flying success. Mr. Rodham got emotional because they worked really hard for this and they all enjoyed themselves. It's been a really nice day. Children's music, you can't beat it. It's just no. so, you know, uninhibited and and, fun. That, and that group are so lucky to have him as a yeah. teacher, aren't they? You know, who, who does inspire them? Exactly, and Dizzy Nicholas just reminiscing there back to your kind of music lessons, that, you know, back in the day. Nicholas, I know that these days you go in to a lot of schools, you do a lot of work. So what difference do you find music makes in schools? I think music really, I mean, it's a universal language mm. and that's the thing, people can just really express themselves through it. And it, I mean, it's scientifically proven that the left side of the brain really develops through music. So this is why it's such a shame that with all the arts cuts and things that, you know, music is being overlooked. And obviously this, this school that we've just watched now, you know, if every school could take a leaf out of their book, I mean, wow, yeah. the yeah. students would just be you know, all of them were well-rounded individuals, they? absolutely. Yeah, and as you were saying as well, it was, it was music classes at school that really spoke to you, isn't it, and really got you through the whole education and that stage of your life. Yeah, that's, that's what I really cared about. Every, every other lesson I just went to because I had to go to it. My mm -hmm. music, I cared about. I did music outside of school. I was on pirate radio, I was DJing and stuff like that. And then I went to college and then realised I didn't even need to be in college, I might as well drop out. And then within that year, I had a single, then the album out, it all went crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Nicholas, for you, when did, when did piano playing come into your life? And well, how, did, how, yeah, how did it all start? Well, quite late. I mean, I was 14 when I kind of got into music and really discovered a love for it. Right. And especially as a, as a pianist, it's quite, quite late to start. But it was a friend of mine at school just inspired me. She was a very good pianist. I was like, wow, this is, yeah. this is what I, I want to do. You know, this yeah. is what I wanted to do as my career, really. And it was never an issue for you that you, you had one hand? Well, I think a bit of teenage invincibility probably setting. You know what it's like when you're 14. You can really do anything. And I kind of, kind of kept forgetting that I had one hand, to be honest. It just wasn't an issue mm. right. for me. So when I was talking to my friends and my family and saying, I want to be a concert pianist, they were all, you know, very supportive. It wasn't until later on in my career when and, you know, maybe those doors weren't quite freely as opened as um, as maybe I'd have liked. But yeah. you know, when when situations like that, it just shows you how like resilient like human beings could be. Could exactly. you find a way? Like yeah, like persistence. Yeah. I think if you believe in something as well, I mean, you've obviously had... How, how bad do you want it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You make it happen. Yeah. But, you know, um, yeah. lots of DJs like Pete Tong are embracing classical and kind of using it. Mm. Would you consider doing something like that? Because we could hook you up now, <laughs> you two, well, tonight. Well, the start <laughs> sounded great. Can you, can you rap to rap down enough? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you know we what? want to know. <laughs> Within rap, is always sampled. Yeah. Like, stuff like that. So, to do it live, you'll just yeah. get a bigger, richer sound anyway. So it would sound cool. brilliant, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. oh, that's your next album, then, What's the next album? Featuring Nicholas <laughs> <Nicholas Nicholas. laughs> OK. <laughs> and we'll take 15%. Yeah. Well, why not? 15? Yeah. <laughs> <Why? laughs> oh, yeah, I'd be hard work, because you know mess, okay. you? Yeah. No problems. <laughs> well, just before we came on air, we were um, obviously reminiscent of the fact that you've both played at the same stadium. We're talking London 2012. Dizzy, you were in the opening ceremony right. of the Olympics, and, Nicholas, you played in the closing of the Paralympics. But to be chosen, I mean, obviously in those ceremonies, folk are looking for that kind of quintessentially kind of... What, what does our culture stand for at the moment? And you were both selected to play there. What an honour. Well, I, I performed with the British Para Orchestra, which is a you know fantastic initiative um, headed up by Charles Hazelwood. The last time I was on the show, yeah, on, on this show, and mm. um, I mean they do fantastic work, you know, promoting disabled musicians, and that's how how we got to perform alongside Coldplay. Obviously, you were selected, and, uh, you know, a proper headliner. So yeah. I think, yeah. uh, I mean, what was your slant? It was just amazing. I mean, it was just that, amazing. It, it was crazy because that's what I'm from there. So there, there wasn't even that stadium wasn't even there. It was built obviously for the Olympics. Yeah. So. 
I can't remember what was even there before that. So to be there, yeah. I've never seen anything that big. I've never performed anywhere that big in the area yeah. that I grew up. So you see, if you see the jacket I was wearing, it was E3. E3 is the postcode oh, of the area. Oh, that. Okay. Yeah, okay. See, if you weren't performing there, you could have listened in your garden. Yeah. Right. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> <Probably isn't it? laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Nicholas, we've got to talk quickly about your new album as well. It's called yeah. Echoes, isn't it? How hard is it then to to make an arrangement just for the left hand on the piano? Uh, it is tricky. I mean, I work with a few arrangers as well who kind of you know sometimes do a better job than I do at the arrangement side of things but um, the piece I'm playing at the end of the show that's one of my own arrangements it's tricky it is tricky yeah. I'm not gonna lie and it's tricky to record you know it's it's so strenuous mm -hmm. I mean you know the recording process well it's hard work uh, but is it right there was a period in history where the actually there was quite a bit of left-handed piano music produced it goes back to the first just after the first world war you're, you're completely right it started in the 19th century as a bit of a show-off thing you know like look what I can do with my left hand my weak hand because Right. Most people left-handed is their weaker hand. And then the First World War happened and hundreds and thousands of people came back with missing limbs. Mm. Usually your right hand, because most people are right-handed, mm. so you're more likely to injure it if, say, for instance, you're in a battle. Right. And, um, and it was because of that these injured servicemen, one man in particular, Paul Wittgenstein, came back and commissioned all of these 20th century composers right. to write for Left Hand Alone. And that's, you know, gave me about 3,000 works for Left Hand Alone, mm. which right. I obviously now play. But now, from his album Echoes, we're going to leave you with Nicholas McCarthy performing Rachmaninoff's G Minor Prelude. Opus 23, number 5.